We'll call this meeting of the April 27th, 2023 Board of Directors of the Sacramento Air Quality Management, Roland Air Quality Management District to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Vice Chair Aquino? Here. Director Daniels? Director Desmond? Here. Director Frost? Here. And Director Guetta? Director Guetta, I think you're on mute. Here. Thank you. Director Hume? Chair Kennedy? Here. Director Lilloe? Here. Director Maple? Here. Director Papineau? Here. Director Serna? Here. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? Director Vang? We have quorum. Thank you. Will you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk please read the announcements? Members of the public are encouraged to observe the meeting in real time at metro14live.sacccounty.gov, participate in person via Zoom video or teleconference line, and by submitting written comments to boardclerk at airquality.org. Comments will be delivered to the Board of Directors. Public comments regarding matters under the jurisdiction of the Board of Directors will be acknowledged by the chairperson, distributed to the Board of Directors, and included in the record. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable system. This meeting is being closed captioned and will be live streamed at metro14live.sacccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated on Sunday, April 30th, 2023 at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. At this time, we have a consent calendar. We are mixing the agenda up just a bit. We're going to push up closed session after consent. Uh, but right now, before us, we have items one through three on consent. Are there any members of the board that have any questions or comments on any item on consent? Seeing none, do we have any public comment? No, Chair, not at this time. Is there anyone in the chambers that would like to make a comment? Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, we can just do voice. We don't have to do roll call anymore, correct? Uh, we should do still roll call because we have people um, calling in. Oh, good point. Thank you. Uh, then uh, please, is there a motion? Motion for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Director Frost and second by Director Maple. Please call the roll. Vice Chair Aquino? Aye. Director Daniels? Director Desmond? Aye. Director Frost? Aye. Director Guetta? Aye. Director Hume? Chair Kennedy? Aye. Director Lilloe? Aye. Director Maple? Aye. Director Papineau? Aye. Director Serna? Aye. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? Director Vang? The consent calendar passes. That takes us to our uh, closed session. Is there any member of the public that has a comment on an item in closed session? Hearing none, then we will recess to closed session. I take it we're going to one of the hearing rooms? Yes, so Thank those you. in chamber can go to the hearing rooms. Those on, on the line, I will send you to a breakout room. Thank you. Come back to order, would the clerk please call the roll? One second. <clears throat> Vice Chair Aquino? Here. Director Daniels? Director Desmond? Here. Director Frost? Here. Director Guetta? Director Hume? Chair Kennedy? Here. Director Lilloe? Here. Director Maple? Here. Director Papineau? Here. Director Serna? Here. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? Here. Director Vang? We have quorum. Thank you very much. And to report out from closed session, the board did meet and we will be placing the air pollution control officers uh, proposed contract on the agenda for our next meeting. And with that, next item, please. The next item on the agenda is the air pollution control officer report. And I have Alberto Ayala here to give his presentation. Give me one second and I'll bring up the PowerPoint. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. And while the slides are coming up, um, I just have a very few um, 
important announcements just to FYI uh, share with you guys uh, some some really cool cool things happening. Um, so let's see. The first one is actually an event that already took place. So uh, my point for bringing it up be, to your attention is is in the hope that you saw some of the press. Uh, releases uh, that were made about it. It actually got international media uh, pickup. Uh, so it is a big deal, right? It's, it's one of the very first sites where we have this, the Tesla semis, fully zero emission electric using batteries uh, that can pull um, a normal 80,000, next slide please, 80,000 uh, pound load. So it's, it is a big deal and um, we wanna do more. So take that to your municipal fleets. Tell, let's, let's work together to access uh, not only state funding, but hopefully soon federal funding, and let's, let's turn these, these uh, vehicles into zero emissions. Um, and of course, uh, you know that I'm gonna say, there's the other flavor, the fuel cells, that we're also gonna be, be tracking. Next slide, please. Um, I think it's really important for us to go on the road and kick the tires. Uh, a few of you have been on, on, on these trips, technology showcases as we call them, uh, and I certainly invite any one of you who's interested, and your alternates for that matter, and your fellow members on, on, on other boards. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we went with our friends from uh, Regional Transit uh, and SMUD, and we went down to the Port of Long Beach. Why? Because that plant that you see behind the picture of all of us is a tri-generation facility. So they're generating hydrogen, power, and steam. And that's the kind of development that we'd like to see here. So when we come to you, some of you, and bug you about using biogas for something better than combustion, and let's think about long term, what is the role of hydrogen for us as a region to enable the transition not only to green, but really generates you know, the cutting edge technology and the jobs that you are all interested in. I, I think we cannot forget this. And then when we were down, we went down to uh, Karma because obviously they make beautiful cars, but we took our friends at Sakar T to see the shuttles that are fully electric. So again, we're trying to you know, do as much as we can and leverage everything we can to make sure that we help our agencies uh, in the transition while the money's still available. So that was uh, something that happened uh, April 7th. And again, I invite any one of you who's interested, uh, it's nothing like kicking the tires, right? Uh, PowerPoint's like, it's, it's, it's only gonna be able to accomplish so much. Uh, and my colleague, Mr. Lemos, was just telling me that we're gonna take uh, uh, another uh, set of smart uh, folks uh, and potentially some of you. Uh, because you were not able to come on, on April 7th. So the, the invite is out there. Um, next slide, please. Federal funding. So everybody's hearing about IRA, right? That's the thing in front of us. And um, I mean, just understanding how the money is gonna trickle out is a job in itself. For us, the opportunity is the money that is gonna come out of federal EPA, and specifically this program, the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, CPRG. You're gonna hear a lot of acronyms. But, um, yeah, I wanna show the map. So um, we were just listed as the lead agency for this MSA. So thank you all who supported us. We had 20 letters of support. And what is relevant here is you see the huge footprint that this program is gonna, is gonna give us, right? So we are venturing well outside of the county. And the role that we wanna play it as a lead agency is coordination. Making sure that all the projects that reduce carbon, that all of your jurisdictions and beyond are interested in, are eligible to compete. So the initial phase is just planning. We gotta put a plan together, and that's what we wanna lead. The real opportunity is implementation. That's where the $4.6 billion that the federal government is gonna make available for regions. So we wanna be able to compete, we wanna be able to capture all the great projects that we have been talking about for, for, for many years now, okay? So, so stay tuned. Uh, and again, thank you to, to those of you who, who supported us in, in, in being the lead agency. Next slide, please. Um, I know Director Terry's here, and this is not just, just for him, but I do need to give credit when credit is due. Uh, Rancho Cordoba uh, has, has published uh, a draft climate action plan uh, that is pretty solid. It's, it's pretty, there's, not, there's not a lot of frails about it. It's, it's pretty straightforward, a wonky uh, uh, document, but uh, we do want to acknowledge that 
you know, this is the kind of climate action plan we want to see. And, and I just want to acknowledge that. And we look forward to working with, with Rancho um, on, on some of what they want to do with, with their climate action plan. So I, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to acknowledge that. And, and thank you for, for the work, uh, Director Terry. Next slide, please. Um, staying or coming back to the topic of, of hydrogen, again, thanks to all of you who sit on the regional sand board, specifically on those of you that have been advocating. Um, you know, we, we like the fact that at least the door is open to considering using the biogas for something other than burning in, in combustion engines. That is the proposal, but the alternative does leave the door open. My, my plea to you is, again, I know this is hard. I know this is going to cost a lot of money, but it's also an opportunity if we can get in front of it. And we've got to think about doing things better than just simply burning them in an engine, even if it's clean, even if it's low carbon, right? But we have, we're at the cusp of, of this technology transition and our region collectively, we need to ask ourselves, when do we jump in? When do we commit and unleash the power of, of, of these new technologies? Um, we could follow, we could be followers. I mean, eventually we're gonna get there. Um, I don't wanna be a follower. <laughs> so next slide. And then the last thing, if you guys are, um, it's going to be a beautiful weekend. Saturday, we're having what turns out to be a community celebration, right? We are going to unveil our mobile monitoring station. It, it literally is one of our regulatory stations on wheels. Um, and the community really wanted to make it a community event. You know, obviously, we can help ourselves. I wanted to make it a more wonky, scientific you know, we're going to do technical discussions, and the community said, no, let's just have people come out, and, and, and we're fine with that. You know, we're going to have a great display. Our partner agencies are going to be there. Uh, again, the, the focal point is the station that is going to our AB617 community in South Sacramento. Uh, but, you know, once we have the, the equipment, right, I mean, it's, it's basically where we need it. Now we can take a station. This is the way that you get monitoring to places where people want it, not building a station that is going to require you know, 10 people to run. So anyways, I just wanted to share that. It's uh, April uh, or Saturday uh, at, from Bacon Middle School. We're going to be there in the morning. Uh, there's going to be free food. So there. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes the APCO report. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? All right, I've got a couple for you. Um, the ZEV heavy duty trucks program. Is there an opportunity working with the manufacturers to have available uh, trucks that can be used on a short term basis so that companies can literally kick the tires and see how it works in their operations? Well, to borrow the, the, the trucks. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. And I think it'd be a good idea. It'd make yeah. people feel more comfortable. The purchasers make feel more comfortable before they put down, you know. Uh, something that's to them untried and true technology. That is, that is a good idea, you know, and, and, and people have tried that, but not quite with, I mean, I think the challenge, and again, we'll pursue it, it's availability, right? I mean, we've been waiting for these trucks and, and it's not like they're sitting out there, but uh, that's a good point to, to pursue. Maybe we can set up an agreement on a short-term basis just to, to trial. So right. we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you with some recommendations. Great okay. point. Director Lillooey. Mr. Lemos? Uh, let me add a little bit to what our Chair uh, Kennedy also talked about a little bit, and then I'll, I'll address your, your question, Director Lolowe. So we do currently have manufacturers loaning out uh, ZEV trucks out to different, um, uh, uh, our, our, some of our largest fleets. Uh, we just recently had a Nicola truck up here, up in the north area, and we also have some of our, our refuse trucks being out on loan. I think the issue is, is that there are only a few of these loaner trucks, and all over California, they want, they want to try them out. So we are doing our best uh, in trying to get as much of that technology being showcased here in the region. But what we also need is for you to reach out to your fleets, to reach out to us to say, we want to raise our hand and we want to showcase some of that, try out some of that technology, because that's also really valuable, right? 
we can get the Sacramento County, whoever, whoever, whatever fleet brings uh, gets to showcase one of this, some of this technology. We can invite the other fleets to come and participate as well, so we can get more, more, um, more of an audience to be able to look and demonstrate the vehicle. And then for your question, Director Loloi, it, it ranges. I mean, we're looking at um, the Tesla uh, semi uh, trucks that we just purchased. And they're, you know, around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a piece, um, and so with incentives, of course, we bring down the the price of the cost. They're still not at cost of of a traditional diesel, um, but but I, I hope that we'll get there soon. We also have to address the the fueling, right? The infrastructure, uh, whether it's battery electric or whether it's hydrogen, which is another added cost. But we also have incentives for that as well. Director Cerna. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Dr. Ariella in terms of uh, what, if any, partnership do we currently have with the Museum of Science and Curiosity? And the reason I ask is I serve on that board of directors as well, and um, just occurred to me that uh, we were going to unveil and celebrate this new mobile air monitoring uh, unit uh, this weekend. Um, and I know for the most part it's going to, even though it's mobile, it's going to stay down in the 617 area. But at some point, uh, is there a possibility that something like that could be uh, showcased for a limited amount of time at the, at the museum so our region's young people can kind of understand the connection between um, air quality science and, and monitoring and why that's important? Actually, uh, very, very well in target, your question, uh, Director Cerna. So a couple things. Uh, so for the rest of the board, the Air District provi provided, and this is before my time, a very modest contribution to, to the museum, to MOSAC. Um, I think it was on the order of 600000 so 150000 or something to that effect a year. So, um, But fast forward today, uh, we're absolutely working uh, with them. They, they are invited, and they were invited to come out on, on Saturday, so my hope is, is that they do make it. But most importantly, I'm on the advisory for the museum that is setting up and designing the display for health and environment, because one of the key, uh, key areas is, is the impacts of, of air quality and health and all that. Uh, Dr. Pan is there and a number of, of faculty from the School of Medicine at UC Davis, et cetera. So we are very much uh, at the table helping them um, get there. And for your reference, when you walk in, the very main principal stage that you see that looks kind of open and empty, that's where this is going to go. So this is a huge opportunity. And, you know, to your point, absolutely, the station is on wheels. We can take it anywhere for show and tell. It's a real working station, so it's a sophisticated piece of equipment. But to your point, we're definitely going to be integrating some sort of display. Um, I did not know how complex and sophisticated the science of designing museum setups is. <laughs> I mean, there's people that they got PhDs to do this. So we're putting our, our uh, <laughs> a small contribution to that discussion. So thank you for the question. Great. Thank you. So all the questions I see, if there's no other questions, if there's no, is there any public comments? No, Chair, not at this time. All right, then let's, next item. The next item on the calendar, the discussion calendar item number five, spare the air overview and update, and I have Jamie Arnold uh, attending via Zoom to give a presentation. Give me one second, I'll bring up your PowerPoint, Jamie. Great, thank you, Selena. Good, good morning, Chair Kennedy and members of the board. My name is Jamie Arno, and I'm the communications supervisor at the district. Today, I'm gonna to be giving you a brief history of the Spare the Air program and a little sneak peek on what's to come this season. I know we've got some new members that I hope will find this information helpful. And for those of you that have been on the board, hopefully this'll be a good refresher about the Spare the Air program. Next slide. So what is the Spare the Air program? Well, basically Spare the Air 
It's a campaign to reduce driving from gas powered vehicles in the Sacramento region. The goal of the program is really to shave the peaks or reduce the spikes, if you will, of pollution on high ozone days. And that's in an effort to reach our attainment standards. Over the years, the program's expanded, and now we also focus on teaching the public about the causes of air pollution, what they can do to reduce air pollution, and how air pollution really affects public health. The program runs May 1st through October 31st, and this year is going to be our 29th year of Spare the Air. The SAC Metro Air District staff, um, we administered the program on behalf of the air districts of the Sacramento region. Next slide. So really the Spare the Air program, it's divided into two campaigns, if you will, but most likely it will appear seamless to you and to the public. So we have our general campaign and that provides and distributes air quality information May through October. Some of the ways we do this are producing a forecast. We distribute that forecast via sparetheair.com, the Sacramento Regional Air Quality app, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, and also our air alert system, which is our email notification system. We provide materials such as brochures, tip cards, and FAQ in multiple languages for the public. Um, we create and distribute monthly newsletters and blogs. Uh, we post social media content, including infographics and videos. We provide air quality information to students and teachers through our website. And we also have a very, very robust partner network right now totaling more than 3,500 partners. That's throughout the region. And these partners include businesses, um, government agencies, medical facilities, community organizations, places of worship. Um, and we provide our partners with air quality tools and resources so they can outreach to their employees, their customers, their patients, their congregations. And we place this general media advertising on different platforms. So you'll see our general media advertising on TV and radio, print publications, billboards, all those different ways that we get the air quality message out there to the public. We also attend a lot of community events spread, uh, to deliver air quality information. And then we work in partnership with other agencies um, to leverage our resources to get spare the air info out to our public. Next slide. So every year the campaign has a theme and that theme usually runs two or three years. Last year and this year, the theme was me plus we equals community. And the idea behind that is to express that all the individual actions we make in our day-to-day -day lives can come together and make a much larger impact for the community. So through our Spare the Air messages, we encourage actions such as using transit, the use of zero emission vehicles, teleworking, all forms of active transportation such as biking, uh, biking and walking, and refraining from using gas powered lawn equipment. So, so the, the, the theory behind this campaign is to show that, you know, all these small little things that we do can add up to make a big difference in our air quality. And so right now I'm going to play you an example of one of our general TV ads that you'll most likely see running very soon. So Selena, if you could play that video. Small changes can make a big difference. Taking transit saves money on gas and reduces the stress of traffic. Alternative transportation like riding a scooter, walking, or biking can also benefit your health. Carpooling can reduce the number of cars on the road, and EV vehicles help reduce car emissions. When we all do our part to reduce driving, our health improves and we help the environment. Every action makes a difference. For more ways to protect your health and the health of those in your community, visit SpareTheAir.com. Brought to you by the Sac Metro Air District and the Air Districts of the Sacramento Region. Thanks, Selena. Next slide. So the second part of our campaign is what we call the episodic portion. And what that is, is when air quality is forecast to meet or exceed a 126 on the AQI, a spare the air alert is issued. And a 126 is right in the middle of unhealthy for sensitive groups. So it's that orange category that you see there on the air, air quality index. And what we do when we ask, when we issue an alert is we ask people to reduce driving on those days to reduce air pollution and also to protect um, public health. We've heard that residents really come to rely on these alerts to make behavior changes, whether it's a transportation related change to reduce pollution or a change to protect the health or their health or the health of someone in their family. Um, an example would be 
a parent knowing there's an alert and deciding their child should refrain from an afternoon outside sporting practice and instead decides to have their child play, you know, outside in the morning when ozone levels are typically low. So I'm going to play, have Selena play now an example of a radio spare the ear alert that you will hear when an alert is issued. This is a spare the air alert. Today's air pollution is high. Here's what you need to do. Reduce your driving or don't drive at all. Share a ride or use public transportation. Help stop air pollution. Avoid heavy outdoor exertion in the afternoon when pollution is at its worst. Protect your health. Get current air pollution readings by downloading the free Sacramento Region Air Quality app today. This alert is brought to you by the Sac Metro Air District and the Air Districts of the Sacramento Region. Thank you, Selena. Next slide. So how do we get the word out about these alerts? Well, a lot of people actually hear them on the television through TV weather forecasts. So just so you know, the TV meteorologists, they actually get their air quality forecast from us. And then they get those forecasts to the public through their TV um, broadcasts, or and they also give out real-time information to the public. And that real-time information also comes from us. Um, other ways we get the alert messages out are through TV and radio advertisements, uh, electronic billboards, social media. And then the staff at the SAC Metro Air District, we conduct or we coordinate all the media interviews related to Spare the Air and Spare the Air advisories. Next slide, please. So why spare the air? Well, spare the air is an emission control measure in the state implementation plan, also known as the SIP, SIP. We are classified as a severe non-attainment and as severe non-attainment for ground level ozone. And so a SIP is required to show how we're gonna meet our air quality goals. So measures like spare the air, um, they're in essential to show that we can meet those goals. Next slide, please. Here's the good news. Over the last few decades, the Sacramento region's air quality, it has improved. And remember, spare the air is meant to shave those peaks or reduce the air pollution spikes on those days that are conducive to high ozone levels. So those days when we're forecasting higher ozone levels. And what do those days look like? Well, the perfect recipe for high ozone days, you're gonna have hot temperatures, you're gonna have light winds, you're gonna have a strong inversion later, layer. And really those three things constitute the perfect storm, if you will. So emissions from gas powered cars and trucks and long equipment, they're all cooked in the hot summer sun and that produces the ozone. Then we have the inversion layer and the inversion layer acts like a lid and it traps the pollution until basically there's a weather pattern change. And most likely in our region, that weather pattern change is going to be a Delta breeze. When that Delta breeze blows in, then the pollutants are basically blown out of the area. So reducing driving on those days when ozone is already forecast to be high is critical to reduce air pollution. Next slide. So looking towards the future, spare the air, it will continue to be a controlled measure in the SIP, in the state implementation plan. And to highlight the impacts of driving reduction, we actually conducted a cutting edge, edge study to evaluate the emission reductions during the shelter in place in 2020. And that study showed ground level ozone was reduced by 10%, PM 2.5 was reduced by 28%, and nitrogen dioxide was reduced by 13%. So driving reduction improves air quality and the health of those in our region, and reducing driving is one of the main goals of Spare the Air. Next slide, please. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here. Um, although the Spare the Air program is focused on ozone, wildfires have become commonplace. As you know, there's no official wildfire season anymore. The months are just classified as more active, active, or less active for the chance of wildfires. And we know that they can happen at any time. Um, additionally, the smoke from wildfires can enhance ozone formation. So we really get a double whammy when the region is impacted by smoke. You can have high PM and you can have high ozone levels. Fortunately, we've been able to leverage those spare the air tools and resources that we already have in place to get information about wildfire and smoke episodes out to the public. 
For example, sparetheair.com during a smoke episode will display PM forecasts and real-time information um, regarding PM. Same with the app. It'll show the PM forecast and real-time information regarding smoke. Um, information can be sent through our already established air alert email notification system. And then the district staff conducts media interviews regarding smoke impacts and forecasts in Sacramento County because we have those great working relationships with our meteorologists and reporters. And then we also have the social media tools in place that we use for Spare the Air. So we can leverage those and also use those to get smoke information out to the public. Next slide, please. And we're looking at a few enhancements for the 2023 season and the 2023 season actually starts on Monday, May 1st. Um, some of the enhancements are gonna include an increase um, at community events. We're gonna attend more community events. We have approximately 50 scheduled so far. Uh, we're gonna be producing more educate, short educational videos for social media and for teacher and student use. We're gonna be looking at the possibility of upgrading our app to a new platform and adding some new features. And then at the end of the season, we're also gonna be conducting a survey. And what that survey will show, it will measure the program public awareness. It'll measure public response to the spare, the air alert. So um, it'll show that perf uh, behavior change and then also quantify emission reductions on spare the air days. And the next slide. And that is it. So I'm happy to take any questions that you have regarding Spare the Air. Any questions? Mr. Director Cerna. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. Um, what I didn't uh, see, though, um, especially as it regards the working relationship that our agency enjoys with local media outlets, is um, whether or not it's the alerts or getting out other important um, air quality information to the broader public. Are we working uh, also with Spanish language uh, radio and TV? Absolutely, yes. We have a very good relationship with Univision. We send out all our alerts in English and Spanish. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Do we have public comment? All right, thank you very much, Jamie. Thank next, you. next item, please. The next item on the calendar, the public hearing item number six, fiscal year 2023 to 2024, proposed budget and fee schedule. And I have Patty Kempner in chambers to give a presentation. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, Chair Kennedy and members of the board. Uh, my name is Patty Kempner, I'm the controller for the district. And I'm waiting for the presentation. We'll get that up and then I'll get started. Okay, uh, so this will be an overview of our 23-24 proposed budget and fee schedule. Uh, we provided you with a lot of information on the budget and this will be a summary high level um, and an opportunity to ask questions or offer comments on that. So next slide, please. What will what'll be covered in the presentation is just a review um, top level of the budget process, what's included in it. We'll look a little bit at our um, three funds. Uh, part of uh, the process is to do a five-year forecast and we'll review that uh, again in summary. And then we'll finish up with the proposed fee schedule for 23-24. Next slide, please. So this graphic is our, uh, depicts our annual budget process. Our budget starts July 1, the, the budget period um, in effect. And we spend a good portion of the year, really from October through March, uh, preparing the budget. It's um, a very collaborative process that all the members of the district, not all, but the majority of the uh, folks in the district participate in with providing headcount information, uh, costs information to be able to pull that budget together. And then uh, it's reviewed uh, several times and by the executive team. And then in March, we bring it to the Budget and Personnel Committee meeting of the board. And we did that this, this March. And uh, the indication was for us to bring it forward to this meeting. Um, this April meeting is the first of two public hearings uh, that are required for our budget. And the second public hearing will be in May. And I did want to mention that in March, we. Um, did notice uh, these meetings, the public hearings. We did notice the fee increase, and that was done by communicating with our current permit holders, um, as well as posting that in the Sacramento Bee. Next slide, please. 
So when we start the budget process, we look at the district priorities. These should look familiar to you in terms of the first three bullets, um, very much in support of our mission statement. Um, and we want to make sure all of our resources are supporting those activities. And so the activities we're listed here are six key areas where our resources are um, focused. And uh, we report that in our budget book. And then we also report that in our annual financial report. So uh, you can see the amount of resources we're applying in those activities. The, uh, the three top areas where we apply resources is air monitoring, clean transportation and future mobility, and permitting and business compliance. That represents about 80% of our budget is allocated to those three core um, activities. Next slide, please. So we have our, our foundation, which is the core activities of the district. And then on top of that, we look at what the major initiatives are going to be for the year. So we have uh, several items listed here. Um, it, believe me, it is not all inclusive. There's a lots of other initiatives that are going on at the district. Um, however, we wanted to highlight a few of these items, and some of them have been mentioned. So um, as part of the APCO report, you heard about the federal grants, the Inflation Reduction Act grants. We've submitted one already, and we have another one that will go in the end of this month for the CPRG. Uh, we also are replacing the Arden Del Paso Air Monitoring Station, and that's a significant capital expenditure for fiscal year 23-24. And then we are also, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, implementing a new software solution that we call AREA. Uh, that was the internal name given to the project, and it will um, be a solution that replaces two key legacy software databases that we have. Uh, one is for permit permitting and compliance, and the other is for transportation incentives. And so that's going to really increase the automation within the district in terms of, of how we do our core processes, as well as there will be a, um, a customer portal so the community can uh, uh, will improve that communication flow between the district and, and the community. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit more about our, our building and um, some options we're looking at for that when I talk about that fund. And then we are doing a comp and classification study to make sure that our positions are benchmarked and our pay is benchmarked and we're competitive in the marketplace uh, so that we can attract and retain um, uh, employees. Uh, next slide, please. So once we've got our core activities, we've got our initiatives, they, uh, we've dollarized those, we pull that up to a top level budget. Um, this year's budget, uh, this year being fiscal year 23-24, we're calling a status quo budget. We have a lot of things going on, a lot of initiatives. However, we are not increasing our headcount. We're keeping that at 97.6, full-time equivalent, no change. We will operate fully staffed, meaning if there is a transfer, retirement, we will backfill that position right away, just because we need all those resources on the ground to be able to implement all the initiatives and the core programs of the, uh, of the, of the district. I did want to mention the, uh, or just point out the graphic there. It's our, uh, our what we call our budget book. It was attached to the to the budget item, and there's a lot of great information in there about the district, about the initiatives, um, and down to key initiatives and accomplishments by our divisions, as well as all the numbers you could ever want on the budget. And that uh, uh, budget book, once it's approved, is posted on our website, so the general public has access to that information as well. Next slide, please. So these are some of the, we'll start the numbers side of things. Um, these are our funds. We have three funds, the general fund, the proprietary fund, and the special revenue fund. So the general fund has most of our day-to-day -day activities in, accounted for in that, uh, that fund. Uh, so some of our EPA grants, our stationary sources revenues, salaries, wages, capital, professional services contracts are all in those numbers, about um, 27 million, 27.8 million of expenditures. The next fund is our Covell building. We do um, own a building at 12th and H. Um, and so this, this is a much smaller fund. It represents, uh, you know, the revenue from rent plus uh, maintenance and um, just the cost to keep the to building going, maintenance and uh, uh, supplies, et cetera. And then finally, we have our special revenue uh, fund, which is where we have all of our incentives. So we heard about all the EV vehicles, et cetera. We, we account for and manage those within our special revenue fund. So I'll talk a little bit more about each of those funds. Uh, but for now, just the overall, we've got revenues planned of 57.1 million and then expenditures of 58.7. We are looking to use um, some fund balance 
uh, to balance that budget. However, we have um, adequate fund balance to do that and still be within our reserve policy. Next slide, please. Excuse me. I believe Director Cerna has a question comment. Thank you. And, yes. and to that uh, last point that you just stressed, um, remind us all uh, what has been in the history, let's say, over the last five budgets um, in terms of the necessary use of um, reserves to balance our budget. Uh, we will. I do have a, uh, a graph in just a moment that shows our reserve balance, uh, fish reserve balance trends. Um, however, we have um, we have been at somewhat break even, um, you know, to to a slight use of fund balance, primarily because it, during the COVID um, transition or period, uh, we were very prudent with with backfilling positions. Uh, we downside cons uh, consulting contracts and really kind of wanted to be um, cautious in, um, in how we operated. So you'll see we've built up about 4.1 million of fund balance within the general reserve over the last three years. But again, that was really as, as uh, prudent management and a choice to just because of the uncertainty of the pandemic. I'm eager to see that slide. I assume it shows uh, past history and projection. Yeah, it has our fund okay. balance. Yeah, we have both. Uh, uh, we have fund balance projection forward for five years, and then we have our fund balance in just a couple slides of the history for the last five years. Uh, I think you can probably tell from my questioning. I just it's always concerning when we're having to dip into reserves to balance any budget. Um, so I'm really curious about the burn rate and how sustainable that is. So yeah, and we'll show you that in just a few slides. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. So talk about our general fund um, just briefly. Um, this is a comparison of our, uh, our current year's budget, uh, the comments are, to the proposed budget for, for next year. And it's split up by revenues and expenditures. But basically, we're seeing an increase in revenues um, in the general fund uh, over year over year. And most of that has to do with a federal grant that we administer on the behalf of local neighboring air districts. So we draw down those funds for those districts and then disperse the funds to them for projects um, within their, um, within their uh, authority. So you'll see our revenues increasing. It's mainly those two grants. A big uh, portion of our expenses are increasing because you see the expenditures go out to them. So it's a it's a break even passive situation. On the expenditure side as well, we have our um, salary, wages, and fringe benefits are increasing. Four percent cost of living adjustment, uh, which is the cap, the max that our employee agreement um, will allows per year. Uh, you'll see the federal grant distributions in there, and then that's the, the capital expenditures is the air monitoring structure I talked about in um, the El Paso um, Arden area. Next slide, please. So here are the, um, the nitty-gritty numbers on that. So this slide shows for the general fund the 22-23 approved budget, the 22-23 projection of uh, where we think we're going to finish the year. Uh, district staff puts that together each year when the, when the budget for the next year is, is being prepared. And then you see in the light green our 23-24 proposed budget. And uh, that's the 25 million, uh, 25.1 million of revenue, 27.8 expenditures, including capital, services, supplies, and wages, and then the, the use of fund balance of about 2.7 million. That does leave us with 18.2 million of fund balance, uh, which as I mentioned, um, is well above the 120 days of expenditures that is required within our reserve policy. Next slide, please. So within the building fund, just a little background on that. As I said, we own uh, the building at 12th and H. It's a three-story building. We have district staff on the third floor. Uh, on the second floor, we have a tenant, uh, as well as some district staff, and then the first floor is parking. So um, what you'll see in this budget is um, uh, that our tenant, whose well space is moving out, has indicated that they're moving out of our facility. They're getting their own facility. And so uh, when that happened, we had to, uh, what, we didn't have to, but we decided to take a look at what are the options for the building rather than the status quo looking forward. So we are in the middle of doing an analysis to say what is the best use of our building uh, given um, the fact that we don't have the tenant, that the tenant will be uh, moving out, plus the fact that we are in a hybrid workplace. So we do have remote working plus on-site working. And so uh, we have, we're working with a consultant on that. And so one of the scenarios would be remain in place, um, move everyone from the second floor to the third floor, lease out the second place, um, second floor, 
space. And then uh, other options include selling the building and either purchasing a smaller building or leasing a smaller facility, because the building is about 38,000 square feet, which in total is more space than we need. Um, so for the budget, we had to pick a scenario to model and include in the budget. So we included the stay in place, um, look for a new tenant, move everyone from the second floor to the third floor. And so what you'll see here is a decrease in rental um, income or lease income as we only have well space for a portion of the year. And then uh, we're uh, funding leasehold improvements uh, to get that, that move to the third floor done and to make sure we've got an environment that's collaborative, that may be hoteling stations, it may be sharing offices, but really um, you know, upgrading uh, that space to optimize the hybrid workplace. Next slide, please. So what that looks like in numbers, again, same format with the current year budget, the projection, and then the light green is the proposed. About 1.2 million of revenue, 1.9 of expense, so a use of fund balance of about 700,000. And that leaves us with the ending fund balance of about 4.3 million, again, well within our reserve policy. And that use of fund balance is, to, um, is for the leasehold improvements primarily. Um, that we would be doing on the, um, the, the consolidation to the third floor. And with those building options, I just want to mention, um, once we get further down the line with that analysis, we'll be coming back to the board with the recommendation on that for your review and approval. Next slide, please. Final fund is our special revenue fund, and that's where we keep all of our incentives for vehicles and infrastructure. And my, the comment on this fund is um, there, you know, it, it, is, uh, it does fluctuate depending on um, when incentives are pushed out. For example, the Tesla trucks will be, you know, a big portion of incentive disbursements, and that, that ebb and flow varies each year. Um, however, our revenue is relatively constant. So next slide, please. Then same format on the slide, and I'll just go to the, um, the green highlighted for 23-24 proposed budget, 30.8 million of revenue coming in, primarily from the state on grant funding. And then we have expense of 29 million, those are incentives distributed to the community. And so just from timing, we have um, an addition to fund balance of about 1.8 million. 1.8 million. And then you'll see our ending fund balance there, which again, builds up over the COVID um, uh, time frame, and uh, our five-year forecast shows us uh, bringing that balance down as we distribute the incentives to the community. Next slide, please. So here's our first slide on fund balance trends. Uh, so the green line is our special revenue fund. You'll see there that uh, we have from uh, fiscal year 20 forward, we have seen an increase in that fund balance. And again, it's because of the fact that we've um, the equipment availability, uh, lots of folks want EV equipment, and uh, we have the manufacturers had some issues delivering during the pandemic as well. And then we have larger infrastructure projects that take uh, a longer period of time to, um, to complete. And so we bring the revenue in in one year and recognize it, and then those disbursements get paid out over subsequent years. And then the general fund is in blue, and the well, general fund in blue and the proprietary in red, both stable um, over the um, the past five years. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned that part of our over, our five year uh, part of our annual budget process, we do a five year forecast. So it's a best demonstrated practice to look forward and say what do we see on the horizon. So we did that for each of the three funds. And for the general fund, for next year, we have a structural deficit of 2.7 million um, in the budget, and that's really with the expenses exceeding the revenues. And so as we look forward, um, it is a conservative look at things um, in that we um, did not include any new revenue sources, and I'll talk about those in the next slide, um, or next two slides. In the forecast, uh, we also um, assume that the cost of living and CPI would be at normal inflationary. We did not keep the hyperinflation included in there. Uh, no change in headcount, so we'll get work, the same headcount over the next five years is what we have included in here. Uh, specific projects on capital, replacing other air monitoring stations, uh, very specific on that in terms of what we'd need to continue to support our core operations. And um, yeah, so um, with that, um, and you'll see in the next slide that deficit continues over that five-year 
uh, time frame, and that's when we talk about the sustainability of that, and we'll talk about, um, talk about that in, in a slide or two. And then the proprietary fund was stable, break even, and the special revenue fund, as I mentioned, uh, we see the fund balance coming down as incentives are increasing as projects are completed and the equipment is obtained. So next slide, please. Uh, here's the slide of our um, general fund, uh, the um, five-year forecast. So the deficit is 2.7 million for 23-24, and we see that just pretty constant. Revenues are not increasing to significantly enough to offset the increase in expenses. And then uh, that grows to about 3.2 million out in the 27-28 range. We do, when we get to 27-28, we do reach that point where we have triggered our reserve policy, and we would be coming back to the board well in advance of that time frame with a plan to get our um, our, forecast, our budget, our expend, revenues and expenditures back to a, um, a break even, if not better. Um, and obviously we're trying to do that now as well, but I just wanted to point out that uh, to, to your point, Director Serna, we, we do reach that point with our uh, reserve policy in 27-28. Next slide, please. Talked about the revenue sources uh, that we're looking at. Um, so uh, the, I'll just talk about a few of them here. The future sales tax measure, the district's making sure that we are um, at the table uh, as those are being discussed. Um, these would be you know, today's measure A as, as things move forward with that to make sure that there's an allocation to the district. Uh, we currently receive measure A money and this we just want to ensure that we continue um, if there's additional new initiatives that are out there. AB 1609 is an additional DMV $4 registration fee uh, that would be benefiting all um, air, uh, air quality districts in California. So that's in uh, legislative review right now. Uh, and then the full cost recovery fix is looking at our stationary sources fees and doing a study, which we've done in the past, uh, doing another study to make sure that our costs are being fully recovered. So the cost of those programs are being recovered by the fees that we're charging. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. This is our proposed fee schedule. Uh, so stopped on the budget. I, th I was going to say I thought we had the, the fund balance forecast slide in there, but I'll have to go back and see if that's um, available. Anyway, uh, that concludes the budget section. Uh, our proposed fee schedule, these are the fees that we um, charge to sources in the community. It, it, they are adjusted. Um, by CPI, which is the California Consumer Price Index, and the proposed increase for 23-24 is 7.67%, and that's effective July 1, 2023. Next slide, please. So the recommended board action for today is to open and close the public hearing on the fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget and fee schedule, provide direction to staff regarding development of the final budget, and then set the public hearing for the adoption of the fiscal 23-24 budget and fee schedule for May 27, 2023. Director Cerna. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the, the presentation. Um, is there, uh, um, remind me uh, again, um, is there, uh, a, a deliberate uh, reassessment of our budget following any kind of may revise um, aspect that affects the agency. Uh, for instance, Sacramento County, we have our recommended budget hearings in June. We have, by law, we have to balance the budget by uh, end of June. Um, but then we come back in September typically and um, adjust accordingly based on the final state budget. So. Remind us all again how we um, keep our thumb on the pulse of what's happening a few blocks away and how it affects us. So I'll, I'll kick us off, and uh, Jamil is here to, to add. Um, we normally do not, based on the May revise, because the biggest impact that the May revise can have on us is on the special revenue fund, right? So let's say the governor decides to allocate more money for incentives. Mm -hmm. And if a fraction of that comes to mm -hmm. us, which we necessarily haven't seen in the past, but if that were to happen, then that would trigger a revise. Um, Patty mentioned that at the moment there is legislation that if it 
passes, it could it could uh, trigger uh, infusion of funding. But again, it probably wouldn't kick in for 23, 24 would be the following. So, so typically, the May revise doesn't impact us. And, and we're not unique. I, I think most their districts don't necessarily get impacted to, to, to the extent that a county might. But Jamil? Yeah, thanks. Jamil Moon's um, Administrative Service Division Manager. Uh, we always watch closely the budget and what's going on. We just got an announcement yesterday that they're looking at um, making some adjustments and some funding that, that might affect us, particularly like AB 617 funding and operational funds. So we are always watching and we uh, look and make those adjustments in our budget. We usually have the habit of coming back, uh, meeting with the budget committee, usually in the fall, and talking to them about where we are, if there's any major changes or status changes. Uh, we have the ability to come back to the board for an amendment. So if there was any material changes that we felt would affect the year, usually as, uh, as uh, uh, Alberto Ayala just mentioned, our director, he said that usually there's a delay, and that's true. Generally, the state grants and things, we're budgeting in a year in arrears, kind of. They come in, then we're budgeting the, the cycle ahead. So usually we have time to react, and, um, and most of the funding at the state level is not, other than the incentive funds, impacting us. And as you can see, there was a significant amount of, of balance still. We have $70 million in incentives, so that could bridge us. We would have that ability to leverage into the, the next cycle where if there was a, a, a reduction in, in those types of funding or an allocation, right? Um, and usually any of the new funding measures would be delayed. Uh, implementation usually is not immediately. Usually it's the next you know, fiscal year. So we, we have time, but we always do have the ability to come back to the board with uh, an amendment and an explanation why we might, might need to change something, and it would be at your discretion to, to authorize that. Um, also, Patty, I did want to mention the uh, five-year forecast is in your packet on page 15, one, 51 and attachment one. If you did want to take a look at it, that was the slide. I'm sorry we admitted it from the presentation, but it is in your packet as attachment one on this board item. Director Maple. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Patty, thank you so much for the presentation and for the briefing ahead of this. Can you hear me out? I'm out. Um, because, you know, obviously I'm new here, so it was really helpful to, to sit down with you and, and get a briefing on this. Um, I do have um, uh, one question and a couple comments. So um, I'll start with my question, and that's around the per capita fee. I know there's some history to this. Can you go into that briefly? <laughs> you really want the history? <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the history is um, some air districts, we stole the idea from some air districts who have uh, a per capita fee as a mechanism for funding. Uh, we looked at this per board direction, uh, brought it to this board um, a few years ago, and uh, the, the board decided at the time not to, not to move forward uh, and instructed us to kind of keep it in, 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 in the back seat. So that's basically what that is. And, and it's as it sounds. It would be a fee to be determined by this board, apply per capita to the jurisdictions within our their district. Great. So it's not something that's on the table right now, but it's something that we could discuss in the future um, if we need the additional funds. Uh, absolutely. There's there's other strategies that are looking um, uh, that we're looking at that we're hoping will materialize. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and then I just want to say, you know, I know that this um, this district produced the air quality benefits of telework memo that was back in February. I think that was really helpful, not just to you know our city, um, other jurisdictions around us, but also the state. I know that, that that those are conversations that are happening all over the the state, and as state workers are in bargaining right now. Um, and so I think I bring that context to talk about the pro proprietary fund and the building that we own. So I think, you know, while you know, it made sense at the time, probably. Uh, my, my thought process is it probably doesn't make sense now for us to be in the business of, of uh, real estate and owning a building. Um, I think especially if we are to stay true to some of these, you know, our own goals and air quality, we're probably saying things like we want to continue to telework. We see, we heard that we hear that from staff as well, it sounds like. Um, and so I just kind of generally wanted to put it out there that, you know, I, I believe that it makes sense for us to, to look at ways to kind of get out of that, the building game um, and to be creative and allowing our staff to have flexibility. Um, because you know, we know that telework is, is a benefit to people in their lives and our air quality. So I just wanted to put that out there, and, and thank you. Thank you. Any others? <clears throat> okay, I will say that uh, Director Ayala and I will be meeting to talk about a strategy to engage the board in the issue of real estate uh, shortly. 
Uh, is there any member of the public at this time before here? Well, let me open the public hearing. Public hearing is open. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the board at this time, whether in chambers or on the phone? Not at this time. None. Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. Um, I can move to set the public hearing for the adoption of the fiscal year 2023-24 budget and fee schedule for May 27th, 2023. I will take that as a motion from the vice chair and a second from Director Frost. Would you please call the roll? Vice, vice Chair Aquino? Aye. Director Daniels? Director Desmond? Aye. Director Frost? Aye. Director Guetta? Director Hume? Chair Kennedy? Aye. Director Lalowe? Aye. Director Maple? Aye. Director Papineau? Aye. Director Serna? Aye. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? I believe he had to jump off. Okay. I just wanted to make sure he puts it on there. Uh, Director Vang? This item passes. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we will entertain public comment. Any, is there any public comment, either in chambers or on the phone, Madam Clerk? Not at this time, Chair. Thank you. That brings us to board ideas, comments, and AB 1234 reports. Is there anything from board members? Okay, I will report out that I, uh, uh, as the air pollution control officer mentioned, there was a trip that uh, took place down to Long Beach on April 7th to Fuel Cell Energy and Karma Electric Vehicle Manufacturers, uh, and I did attend that. Uh, I will say that, um, it, I, as Director Ayala alluded to, that perhaps another trip is coming for the fuel cell energy project. I would highly recommend that those of us who are on the board of other agencies, specifically regional sanitation and those of us that oversee solid waste departments, um, you know, that we highly encourage those agencies to send representation. Uh, it was very enlightening and shows that, you know, this stuff is not necessarily of the future, but it's of the present and the future. So, thank you. Any others? We're adjourned.